a couple of days ago, I was asked this absolutely fabulous question by one of the students in the inaugural Themesis short course, Top 10 Terms in Statistical Mechanics, which is actually a short course in Introduction to Generative AI. And the question was this, what's the difference between generative AI and AGI or artificial general intelligence? And isn't that just a fabulously powerful question? So here's the answer in a nutshell. If you go to the Themesis website, that's themesis.com, hit the resources button on the menu. It'll take you down to some very good resources for generative AI. But let's just get that question real quick. Generative AI, you know its functionality because you know the equations. There are three basic kinds of generative AI. There's the generative AI that's based off Boltzmann machines, and that's the precursor to deep learning. It's the precursor to GANs, generalized adversarial networks. They both use Boltzmann machines. They both use a specific form of learning in those machines, and that learning is most typically its contrast of divergence invented by Jeffrey Hinton. That's one vector or one avenue, let's call it. The next one is variational inference. One of the most prominent researchers there is David Bly, and he wrote with Kusukelber and McAuliffe a really great tutorial that we refer to fairly often. It's entitled Variational Inference, a tutorial for statisticians, meaning you need to know a little something before you walk into that room, but it is really pretty readable. And the notion of variational inference is that you have a latent space and you are going to model that latent space with a model that is very typically something from the exponential family. That would be, for example, a a Gaussian or a set of Gaussians. The third kind of generative AI is the encoder-decoder architectures, which is led, of course, to transformers. And encoder-decoders fall into that general rubric of variational autoencoders. We often point people to a very excellent tutorial by Kingma and Wedding. So three general areas, the Boltzmann machine base, that's type one, variational inference, that's type two. And by the way, that leads to active inference, which is Carl Friston's invention. And then type three, variational autoencoders, which includes the encoder decoder and leads us direct to transformers. Now, I misspoke a little bit there because transformers are not an evolutionary outgrowth of variational autoencoders. They do indeed have encoder-decoder elements, but they're not variational in nature. The best way to think about them is for me to tell a little story about not so much the birds and the bees, but the birds and the dinosaurs. So I'm inspired for this analogy by having recently watched this fabulous Netflix series on life on our planet, and it is so gorgeous, and the cinematography is fabulous. The CGI is incredible. It is amazing. Morgan Freeman is narrating. It is gorgeous. And when it comes to the dinosaurs, there's, of course, amazing footage, and it shows how the original birds were basically winged dinosaurs. So birds such as we have today, like the chickens in the backyard that you can possibly hear, are truly dinosaurs. They're winged dinosaurs. So dinosaurs had to evolve a number of things in order to create those winged dinosaurs, which became our current day birds. They had to evolve wings, of course, and feathers. And over time, there were other subtle but very significant modifications. For example, that wishbone, the bone that our kids make wishes on and break apart at Thanksgiving. That's a new one. That's not in the original dinosaurs. So there's all sorts of evolutionary steps. And in a similar way, we can say that transformers are an evolutionary outgrowth of basic generative AI. They're still generative AI, absolutely. But they've got things that are not in those prior three basic generative AI categories that I've just identified. So let's go back a step, identify the math, physics, and information theory that comprise the basic generative AI mechanisms, and then we can identify the new things that advance transformers beyond those basics. In each case, And this is something that we've been really bringing out and emphasizing and truly working with in the short course that we've introduced. And that is that there are three fundamental elements in building these generative AI methods. They are in order. Number one, the reverse callback Leibler divergence. This leads us to number two, Bayesian conditional probabilities, which leads us to number three, some usage in some manner of statistical mechanics. Those three combined form the essential core of all these generative AI methods in each of the three different vectors. Boltzmann machine-based, variational inference, variational autoencoders. They all use the same three 
fundamental core elements in building out those mechanisms. Now, when it comes to transformers, of course they build on those same three core mathematical information theory, statistical mechanics methods, but they add, and they add in elements that are so dominant that we tend to focus on those and forget the foundation layer. So what we add in with transformers dominantly are the multi-head attention and the positional encoding. Both of these are very significant advances. They're equivalent to dinosaurs evolving both wings and feathers. And if we were to study birds today, we'd probably put most of our attention, for example, on the mechanics of avian flight and less on how they descend from dinosaurs. So similarly, when we study transformers, we put our attention on what makes them work. And even when we read the original paper, there's really no connection back to that base layer of generative AI methods. For our benefit, what we want to do is think of these as two entirely different layers. The first layer, three big puzzle pieces, is the callback liebler divergence, Bayesian probabilities, and statistical mechanics. For transformers, we keep those and add in multi-head attention, which is really taking that notion of statistical mechanics where you have spins or orientations or states of a system that are up or down or sometimes on or off. If you're looking, for example, at a Bolson machine, Hinton and Salakutinov describe it as being a bi-state system on or off nodes. In transformers, multi-head attention, vector spins, that means that there's six different directions in which this unit can be on or off. Secondly, when we go back to really basic generative AI, for example, Bolson machines, and you look at how they treat nearest neighbor interactions. They're coded explicitly via connection weights in Boltzmann machines that would be the restricted Boltzmann machine, and the inspiration for that is a mean field icing model. I discussed that in other videos and more in depth in the short course. When we go to transformers, we do positional encoding. We do a sinusoidal method that lets us take into account the natural congruence of follow-ons between a word that we're examining right now, that could be a word, a piece of code, an element in an image, versus something that is either near or far, depending on the sinusoidal length that we're using in the sinusoidal position encoding. So there's significant evolutionary steps that we have when we move from basic generative AI to the more advanced transformer-based generative AI that is so popular today. You don't necessarily see the reliance on those three foundational elements when you look at most of the literature on transformers, and that includes, of course, the originating paper, which was, by the way, a conference paper and necessarily brief. So when you look at some of the deeper expositions, I've got links to some very good resources in the description box below. You'll see the connection and the flow through of thoughts from the original generative AI work to transformers as a form of generative AI that include significant new innovations. And from here, we can take a look at what would be necessary to go from generative AI to AGI, or artificial general intelligence. Now, artificial general intelligence, on the other hand, AGI, is going to be beyond those. In each of those areas, here's the essential understanding that we want to have as a key takeaway. You know what they can do because you know the equations. When you know the equations, you know the architectures. When you know the architectures, you know what they can do. And no amount of dressing things up, putting on various add-ons and bolt-ons, changes the core. You can get better at what they are essentially suited to do, but you can't change their core nature. So you're not going to get general intelligence out of any of them. You're going to get each of them doing what they do best, essentially an auto-encoder type of thing, or learning a latent representation space where you can interpret the space even though you don't have a training data set for every single element that you might care to model. That's the variational inference part. AGI, on the other hand, it must, it absolutely must include capabilities that are not part of the generative AI space that we have right now. Among them include ontologies. We have to make that connection between the connectionist, which is what we talked about with the Boltzmann machines and to some extent with the autoencoders, and not really in the variational inference realm. That's more of a modeling mechanism. But let's just say those other two have a neural network component that has typically been regarded as a connectionist type of architecture using a really, really, really old phraseology. But that versus the knowledge graph type architectures. Up until now, those, those two have really not met super well. In an AGI, they must meet, they must intermesh, they must connect. 
So let's return for a moment to that earlier allegory about how generative AI, at least the basics, were like dinosaurs, and introducing transformers was akin to introducing the winged dinosaurs or birds. So there was an evolutionary outgrowth within that one evolutionary group. At the same time, within the Jurassic era, there were indeed mammals. There were early mammals like the large sloth. And obviously, mammals and dinosaurs, even winged dinosaurs, did not intermingle. They did not interbreed. They did not produce a new species. But what we need right now is that sort of magical moment where we do indeed fuse a winged dinosaur or a bird with a mammal. Mythologically, you can tell that I've been watching some Harry Potter lately, there's this mythological notion of a hippogriff, which is the child produced between a union of a mare, a female horse, and an eagle. So that's what we're needing. We're needing this mythological creation, but a very practical one where we combine the essence of both horse and eagle and produce a hippogriff something that has the ability to bear live young and run in the ground like a horse and to take winged flight like an eagle which in this case is a transformer such as an LLM. Part of why you've been introducing corticons is that we have a long-term stable temporal activation mechanism that can reach into ontologies and help ontologies pull down and this is the second part. You need feedback loops. You need guidance. So the ontologies need to be able to guide the processes at the connectionist level, and the connectionist activities need to be able to guide activation of ontologies. And there needs to be a complete cycle. Third key element in AGI, and that is we're going to have control, not just feedback, but control over the activation in a much more nuanced and comprehensive way than we've been allowed so far. That's why we're working with the cluster variation method for that latent space that we've defined with the corticons that allows variable activations of the numbers of nodes that are active at a given time that is completely independent of a push up from single dependent activation the way that we have right now. We'll talk more about this later. It's a fundamental element, but it is from that control system that you begin to connect to the goal state for the AGI. So actually, there is that fourth element. That needs to be the goal state, which is going to be intermeshed with yet another element, which is going to be that differentiating boundary. This is why I, this is why I keep spending time on Kristen's notions of active inference, and that is that you need a differentiating boundary. Kristen calls it a Markov boundary, and others do as well. The notion that there is a separation between self and the external world. And to be truly effective, an AGI must have that differentiation. So let's run through those quickly again. You're going to have to have, number one, interaction with the ontology layer. Number two is you're going to need to have feedback mechanisms, both coming down from the ontology layer and coming up from the connectionist or data processing, signal processing level. Third, you're going to need to have control loops, control over these processes. Fourth, we need a goal setting capability or a sense of purposefulness that can wind up being very complex. And fifth, we're going to need a boundary, a sense of differentiation between self and other. Five components, AGI. Not that terribly far down the road. If we can start to talk about those components now, which we can, and we can start to draw some preliminary architectures now, which we can, and we can start to work the physics for that very essential middle layer that I haven't even described as as an essential component, but it is, it's inherent in the necessary architecture, then we are not that terribly far off. So generative AI, we've got it right now. It works pretty well, but there are subtleties and nuances and issues that are being addressed by the best minds that we have. And then AGI, artificial general intelligence, coming up sooner than we think. It's like the sign that you get in some vehicles. Objects in the rear view mirror are closer than you think. That's what's going on right now. Aliana Moren from Themesis, thank you and have a lovely day. We'll see you soon. 